Yeah, good evening, folks. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, again, uh, you're here for a uh, chat with uh, Dennis Kenyon tonight. So we'll kick into it very, very shortly. And, and again, depending on where you are in the world today, uh, is what time it is for you too. So thanks very much for joining us. And I'll just give you a quick rundown on the, the webinar controls and what to sort of expect over the next sort of 30, 40 minutes. And then we'll kick in and introduce Dennis and uh, we'll get the man on the line and, and start talking about some of his stories. So very quickly, what I'll get you to do is you should see a floating panel there with the, the webinar and uh, you should see an option there to be able to raise your hand. So if you can hear my voice and you can see the screen there, uh, you can use the, the little tool there to raise your hand and also you'll see a chat box if you want to uh, just quickly drop a, a note in the chat box so I know that you can, you can hear me. And if you just let me know what you can see on the screen, that would be fantastic. Great. Okay, so we've got a couple of people there, and yep, you can use the controls. So what I'll do is I'll put everyone's hands down, and uh, very quickly we we'll get into that there. So I'm just going to unmute Dennis, and we've got uh, Dennis on the line there. You go, Dennis. Can you hear us there? I can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. All right, guys, let's uh, kick in and 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 launch off. So, folks, very uh, grateful to to have Dennis on the line and share some of his experience with us today. So, most folks will know Dennis's background uh, pretty well, but I'll just give a, a little bit of a bio, uh, and that way, depending on what context you're coming into this call, uh, you'll have a, a bit of an idea of what uh, Dennis has been up to for the last 60 years or so. <laughs> so, Dennis started flying in the the RAF in 1952, and has flown some 85 different aircraft types between Tiger Moss to Gloucester Meteors and a whole heap of things in between we'll chat about. In 1972, he joined a Spooner Aviation uh, from where he developed what was to become one of the UK's most successful helicopter distributor ships. And the process became synonymous with the Enstrom brand in the UK and throughout uh, Europe, uh, which he so capably promoted. And looking at about 137 helicopters sold over a 10-year period is a pretty impressive effort. Dennis is a helicopter ATPL holder, a flying instructor, and a type rating examiner. He's also an acclaimed display pilot and evaluator. So Dennis has flown more than 30 different types of rotary wing aircraft and amassed in excess of 13,000 flying hours. He performed at, uh, at more than uh, 1,200 display flights, and actually that's up to 1,500 since this was written, and has appeared in, in several feature films. He's represented Great Britain at four World Helicopter Championships, uh, winning the aerobatic freestyle title in 1992. And in 2005, he set up a flying scholarship to sponsor uh, to helicopter PPL standard, those with a passion for rotary wing flight, and continues to convey his experience through writing articles on helicopter test flights, flight theory, and flight safety. So Dennis, thank you very much for being able to join us. Well, thank you very much, Mick, for having us. I say, um, I'm not sure that I should say good morning or good afternoon, but it's, uh, I use the Australian good day to all. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's let's crack in. And uh, folks, if you've got questions as we go through, you can uh, type them in the in the chat box there or the uh, question box, and I'll see them come through. And uh, look, I'll try and handle them as they come up, or we'll stop for for questions as we go through. And uh, if you've got a microphone at your end, I'll actually be able to unmute you and can uh, talk direct to Dennis uh, that way. So Dennis, look, uh, you know, you got a, a fair few career highlights, and I'll, what I'll say is this interview actually doesn't sort of stand alone. I guess there's a a, a quite an in-depth interview that uh, you and I did, which is on the Rotary Wing show over at episodes 14 and 15. So where I can, I'm going to try and avoid sort of doubling up on some of the conversations, uh, just so folks can get the most out of this one and go and listen to the other interview to get some bits and pieces. So some of the, th the stories, Dennis, that you've got, um, we, which we probably won't get into too much depth, but you know, you've had a, a double engine flame out in, uh, in a jet um, at night and successfully landed that. Uh, we talked about the uh, Enstrom dealership and the uh, world championship uh, win. And we also cover your, uh, you know, your, your crash in the 300 uh, in that interview. So we won't sort of go over that sort of terrain area there again. But uh, I thought we might kick off with a bit of your RAF days. If uh, you want to just talk about the, the photos there on the slide, and I might be able to get a couple of stories out of you. Yeah, the slides come up this side. Um, hello, folks um, and ladies, if you've got any. Um, the top left picture you're looking at is me acting as a queer um, between two of my mates. Um, the guy on the extreme right of the top top left picture with a bright check called Brian Armstrong, he was actually best man at, uh, at my first marriage. Um, the aircraft that a lot of you will recognise called his a meteor. It's a single-seat meteor. 
Mark IV, that particular one is, um, you don't learn on that, of course, you learn uh, on the Mark VII. That particular base was in Somerset, bit number 209. They called it in those days the Advanced Flying School. It was really a jet conversion unit. We all had our wings one that time. And you went down there onto that course, and I can't remember the hours we did, but it was about six months to, to learn to fly the jets. Uh, that picture was us three of us larking about. Um, small story there, I'm full of stories. I'm afraid, but a small story there is that those three guys there, you can see we were 19 or 20 there, I guess, we called ourselves the Zoy Boys because of the effort being called Western Zoyland. And just oddly enough, I wrote an article that appeared probably in the last five years in one of the UK magazines um, and referred to this particular incident. In fact, it was at that airfield uh, that I had the Dublin to failure at night in a, in a Mark 7 meteor. But somebody wrote in um, as a result of the article and said, you can't be the Zoid Boys because we here now at West Zoid and have a micro ride school. We are the Zoid Boys. I had to reply and said, Well, you're writing here in 2005. I'm talking about 1954. Anyway, that's that picture. And one underneath is another, yeah, I'm looking at it. It's another Mark IV single seat. You can see just a single cab seat. Canopy. It's really 72. My log looks full of flights with number 72. So I must have done that one. And the picture, the bigger picture, the colour picture, is a tornado. I've never flown the tornado. I wasn't converted on I left the RF long before that thing came into service. I was invited to go up to Mara with nine squadron, or a few months ago this time last year, perhaps. Uh, and uh, the, the CO of nine squadron wanted to uh, get converted to a helicopter. He was about to leave the service and had ideas of being a flying instructor and wanted me to, to give him in fact the course. So we swapped things for things. So, you show me one of yours and I'll show you one of mine sort of thing. So I got to fly the, uh, in with him um, in the tornado. That's a GR4 tornado. And um, he, he and I flew the helicopter. Yeah, Des, I'm thinking, you know, as a young 20-year-old uh, flying jets around the, the UK, and I'm not sure if you, you know, you went overseas, but, you know, that must have been, uh, you know, life, I don't know, was it fast cars and things like that? Like, it, it must have been a pretty good life, um, you know, being, going out and doing those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, I suppose because of the age thing um, and the lower level of discipline that was everywhere in those days, um, to be strapped to a 600 mile an hour aeroplane at age 20, that's what it was at the time, yes it was thinking about it, um, be screaming around the countryside at 600 miles an hour on low level cross countries uh, was quite something. Uh, I, I said to a few people that um, I, I suppose at that time, everybody in the world that I knew, knew I could fly a 600 mile jet fighter. But my son, you know, was also quite a qualified pilot in 2000. And subsequently after we lost him, uh, his headmaster called me with condolences, and she was nice to hear. Uh, and he said, but what was he doing flying a helicopter, in a helicopter? And I said, well, he was flying it. He said, well, what he was flying it, yes, that's what he did. He was about becoming a flying instructor. The thing, the reason I tell you that, the odd thing about that is that not one person in his school knew that he could fly a helicopter. So when I was 19 or 20, any qualification I had, the world knew about it. I couldn't have <laughs> well, it. was always the old joke. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tremendous fun. I can't think of anything better. Yeah, there's always that, uh, the, the, the joke, you know, how, how do you know there's a, a pilot in the room? And uh, don't worry, they'll tell you. You got it. Yeah, that's right. We 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 restrict that to helicopters. I didn't know there's a helicopter pilot in the room. Just wait. <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, you know, at some stage you you got out of, out of the uh, the RAF. So, what was the driving factor in in leaving the forces? Well, there were several reasons. But one of them was that I didn't quite see eye to eye with the service over a particular operation. Uh, I cannot, I'm afraid, talk to you about that now. At some stage in my life, before I kick the bucket, fall off my perch, I may well do that thing. Um, but the other was that Duncan Sandys in those days was the Ministry of Transport. And quite wrongly, we know now, he probably didn't know at the time, he announced that the uh, Lightning would be the last manned fighter i.e. everything was going to become remotely controlled. He was wrong about that. He's probably becoming a bit more right these days. So I thought, well, I can't leave myself in service. And I wanted to become an airline pilot. 
So I opted to leave the service. Um, I got some reasonable sum of money, first time in my life, bought myself a car, and, and out I came. So that was really the prime reason, I suppose, because I thought uh, I would have a future in the Air Force. All right, I'll, I'll shortcut that story because uh, you told Fastman, but uh, you basically didn't end up doing the uh, the airline side of things because they, they told you you were too old. Well, I wasn't too old. I, I joined Northeast Airlines in 1972. Well, I was I was selected to join them and selected to go on the Trident course. They were flying in those days at 700 my count, um, and that's what I was going to do with myself. And I talked to the chief pilot on one occasion when I was about to sort of start crew training with them and he said look you do realize that at your age and the and the rule we've got about I can't remember what it was 15 years in the right hand seat before you make captain uh, and at your age and since we've got a policy retiring earlier than some of the other airlines you never know, probably not going to make captain that coincided with meeting a man called Roy Spooner who was starting a helicopter business and he said, how do you like to fly a helicopter? Um, and I suppose for whatever reason, um, I thought we were noisy, dirty and dangerous at the time, but for every reason, he showed me a thing called the Enstrom. Um, it, to me, as glamorous as, as it could be, and so I elected to join him. And I actually thought at the time, I'd join him for six months and then go back to the airline. But I, here I am still, God knows, 40 years later, still flying helicopters. Yeah, that's what I say to all the fixed-wing pilots that I know have converted across. You know, they've, they've come across to the dark side, and uh, they'll never go back. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know that one. Well, the um, well, I guess we'll come back to the, the training and, and the uh, instrument side of things shortly. But you know, along the way, a lot of folks know. You know, you, you obviously flew as one of the, the pilots in the in the filming for, for Black Hawk Down, but uh, you also did uh, Goldeneye, and obviously this this picture oh, here. Yeah, in the, yeah. And the next um, next ones are the Black Hawk Down ones, but yeah, can you can you talk about the the Goldeneye experience and the whole James Bond and, oh. and sort of you know the the film flying aspects? Yeah, Goldeneye was I'm guessing in the early nineties. Um, uh, one of the producers, Ted Charles, uh, got hold of me. He was, he was given my name by a, a dear dear friend of mine. I'm going to mention his name, Mike. Mike is the guy that owns the 747 that sits in the background at Dunsfold. He owns that 747 with a big blue tail. Anyway, Mike must have passed, because he was heavily into the film business, passed my details to the Ted Charles man, and uh, he just booked me to do the film, um, and out we went. I don't know if you want me to talk about Black Hawk Down and such, but uh, he, he booked me to go out and, and do that film. I'd done quite a few, but the Golden Eye one came along, uh, and uh, they wanted a shot of a helicopter landing on a moving train and entering a tunnel. It, the location was the Neen Valley Railway. We all went up to these, and in those days that was an airfield. It's now, it's, I think it's the studios now, or whatever it is. Rose West Space at one time, and did a lot of practicing. Now, I, everyone thought I was going to use an Enstrom for that, and of course I could not because. They wanted the helicopter to land on the moving train and then descend into it with a couple of plane short doors. And if you've seen the film, so much of what we filmed fell on the cutting room floor. But that's what they wanted. But of course, it had to be a tube later. And a small tube later at the time, the only one was a Robinson. So we actually used a Robinson for that shot. Um, uh, I do remember a small, full of, small, full of stories about that. They asked me if we could put a red star on the side of the helicopter. Well, CA rules don't permit you to dress up helicopters without their permission, certainly with international logos. So I rang the Russian embassy uh, and spoke to a guy who was put through to a guy, the radiation man, and said, I just want your permission to put a red star on the side of a black helicopter. And he said, Do you ever read the newspapers or listen to the news? We haven't used a red star now for about 10 years. So I went, Oh. <laughs> Put whatever you like on, and that's what we did. Anyway, uh, God, no, great film. I enjoyed it. Got paid well. Where was the actual um, the the train? Where were you doing the, the filming from? Neen Valley Railway. That's the uh, run runs from um, oh, Watford, isn't it? The, the Dishes Railway there, um, up to the. Oh, no, it was a Dishes Railway for a long time. We did the practice there. They actually built. 
they actually built a plastic bridge and placed it across the railway because I'd done some film shots of, or advertising before that and I said look you don't need to build a bridge just two miles down the road there is one no no we want our own bridge they turned up with half a dozen trucks and a plastic bridge which they put across it and if you've seen the film you'll see the red star plonk right in the middle of the bridge it's pretty impressive where they can knock up. Uh, you know, their engineers on a, on a movie set are amazing. Just to leap forward slightly, if those of you have seen Blackhawk Down, the the whole of the bridge that spans the Howard Boulevard was plastic, uh, and so was the Olympic Hotel. I remember we were wait, while we were waiting to do the actual filming, walking up and down the set, um, they used hundreds and hundreds of the Somali locals there, because we not Somali locals, um, rock and locals to simulate the Somalis um, and I remember thinking to myself I could do with a drink I walked into the Olympic Hotel like a ball uh, and I was sitting among scaffolding it was a plastic vintage. okay so um, you, you on set it looked real, real enough that you walked inside to oh yeah, get I'm, a drink shots down the bottom left of the screen um, it's an unusual shot I've not seen, seen that one before I'm not, not sure how much of those are plastic um, I would be the second um, Little Bird, uh, they're all the MH um, 60s or 4s, the 4 blader and the 6 blader. Um, uh, the Americans called them Little Birds, we called them the MD 500, I would have been the second one. The one on the ground there was Bob Z, the well-known American film pilot Bob Z, uh, and I was number two to him on that shoot. And just above the picture, I think, that's one of the practice helicopters, that's an MD D model. Um, can't really see whether it's a an age or not. And uh, the big picture, it, well, there we go. That is Jerry Grayson that I was talking about just before we came on air here. Um, Jerry was the youngest. I don't know talk about Jerry, but there we go. Um, Jerry was the youngest uh, ever naval helicopter pilot. He, he qualified at age 17, I think. But there we are, just messing about. I've, got curly hair now, so it's all got hair but it's not quite so curly and there we are what I've put on the film discussing aerial filming tactics well of course we weren't we dug a little racetrack and got some friendly ants and uh, made our ant with a prod with a stick race around the track four times <laughs> sort of daft thing you do when you've got time to spare and filming and how long were you guys in Morocco for for the whole filming how, how long was the, no, the, the period? Yeah, it was, well, the, sh the whole overall shoot was for three months, I've had 200, and so I'm told, 250,000 dollars a day. The infamous Ridley Scott, now Sir Ridley Scott, um, was in charge. Wonderful, wonderful film man, of course. Produced a superb film. A bit too much blood for me in it, but uh, a wonderful film. And the overall shot, the overall thing was three months. I was out there, I think, for about 14, 15 flying days. Okay, and you had the little birds. I think you had a, a twin squirrel. And were the the US Blackhawks there at the same time, or were they they, they filmed separately? Squirrel above. I was up in the MD for the um, little bird uh, above, mostly above and behind Bob Z, who was also flying um, the little bird. Um, we also had a um, not a one two one two, a bit like a Huey there. Um, but Jerry was doing, he was the camera ship, I was story ship. Excellent, all right. Let's um, head back to, the, I guess, the UK side of things and the training. And, and previously you said, you know, obviously the, the Spooner Aviation and, and uh, being an interim dealership, uh, one of the ways you, you got it in the training side was, you know, these people would buy a, a new helicopter and, and they need the training to go and fly it. So, yeah, can you just talk about, I guess, your experience of training and, you know, it seems such a, a big gap between the display flying you do and then sitting in, a, you know, a machine teaching someone to hover. Uh, so, you know, can you talk about the, the crossover effect there and, and sort of how you found the whole training experience? Yeah, for sure. I don't want to monopolise the whole of the program, but that's quite a step there. Um, I met the infamous Roy Spooner, who was an estate agent in Surrey. He was the Spooner of a firm called Hoare. Sardin is Sardin. Sorry, that's not too much like that. It's now the man group. I met him, and as I said earlier, he wanted to get into helicopters, uh, and I joined him. And he immediately said that, because he had a few bob, he immediately said, We could go to America and take on an agency for a thing called an Enstrom helicopter. My knowledge of helicopters was very limited in those days. 
I think the only thing I'll ever float in the RAF was a, a whirlwind, but that wasn't it either anyway. And we went to America, saw that, you can see just a part of the hull on the right hand side with me as a youngster uh, handing one over to a guy. Um, it was a very, very pretty looking helicopter. My idea is helicopters were sort of frameworks and you know, horrible looking things. And I suddenly saw that thing and it had chrome controls and fluffy carpets and fluffy seats. And I said, Roy, I don't read all about this market, but surely that machine will sell, and bearing in mind that in that time it was $50,000, which at the exchange rate that was current in those days would have been a whisker over £20,000, where you couldn't get a decent carpet price for that. Um, and so he, believe it or not, placed an order for 24 instruments. And my job was to sell them. We start, they weren't coming all at once, of course, they were being shipped over to a month. And within, I'm guessing now, but something like six months, we sold the first 12. But it quickly became apparent to me the big problem was people would buy them, but they couldn't fly them. So we needed this training school. So uh, another dear friend of mine who actually converted me onto helicopters was uh, Captain William Bill Bailey, BFM. Uh, he joined the company as um, as our chief flying instructor. I set about getting myself a flying instructor's rating. I, funny enough, I got the examiner's rating first before the flying instructor's rating. Uh, and the with a lot of effort, lots of uh, display, which I'll come on to in a second, uh, lots of display, lots of effort, lots of advertising, we started to sell these things. And, and the, the kick in those days was that if you buy one of these machines or whatever it was, I think the retail price was 25000 thereabouts, it went up because those were the days of inflation. If you buy one of these things, we will teach you as part of the package, and that's what we did. And so the sales were going on, chugging along really nicely. Now, the display thing comes into a bit there, because a, a year or so later, um, the for those of you who have heard the name, F. Lee Bailey was a very well-known defense attorney in America. He defended Patty Hearst Lady. Um, he defended the Boston Strangler. And most notably, um, he defended Ernest Medina, who was involved in a thing called, you can look it up on the internet if you want to know more, the Milan Massacre, where they actually went into a village suspected of doing all sorts of nasties to the American troops, and they massacred a lot. Uh, F. Lee Bailey defended this man so well, he, he got off, and he became um, he became vice president of sales. He then called me one day and said, look, we're opening a new plant to increase production uh, capacity for the machine, and Mike Meager is going to do a display. And I thought, well, display what? What's he going to do, sit and hover? So over I go with Roy again. I was a regular visitor to uh, an anomaly in Michigan, which is where the instrument factory is based, it is. And uh, the time came, and Mike Meager did a display very, very much the same sort of display that lots of people have seen on the, on the internet uh, in an Enstrom. And I remember saying to Roy, if we could get that guy over to England at Farnborough, um, I think it would improve our sales a lot because this Enstrom was a, a pussy looking helicopter, a bit too pretty to be a helicopter in those days. And so over he came, and I'm now talking about 1974, it might be 73, because I think I did the 74 and 75 and 60 spray. But anyway, he came over, and that stand where you see that picture of me handing over the keys, was knee deep in people wanting to know what this helicopter was. So I'd like to think that the display that Mike did dramatically improved our sales. My boss then said to me, Dennis, look, you know, can you do that? And being a cocky pilot like we all are, said, of course I can. So we'll go and practice as you can. And I actually taught myself to do the display. I was a display pilot in the Royal Air Force as well, so I had done this some new values. And I taught myself in the Instrom. Uh, and so I, I don't know what I did, I'm probably 20 or 30 displays a year in those days, and it went on from there. Uh, All right, well, we'll hit the, Dennis, we'll hit the display flying uh, next. Uh, just before we leave the training, I was going to say, like, you know, when, you, when you're teaching someone, is there a particular foundational skill that you, that you really 
focus on and spend time on at the expense of other things or how do you sort of approach the, the helicopter training and, and, and what do you see as the priorities for people? Well, we may well have a few qualified instructors on board now and if not, when we come to rerun it, they'll be here. So I'm a bit of an unusual instructor. Um, I believe, and it's worked for me, I believe that for sure you do an adequate briefing and you make sure that your pilot, I don't call them students, no such thing, he's a pilot once he handles the controls, you make sure your pilot um, understands the principles of what you're allowed to do. But that all comes out in the briefing. And then the best thing you can do is demonstrate to your absolute ability and accuracy what you have just discussed. Then you invite the pilot to have a go. He will do it with varying degrees of success. Once he's got any aspect of what you've shown correct, you don't go on to it any further doing much the major exercises, you then keep moving forward and forward and forward on the more difficult exercises. But to try and nutshell that, it's all about a good demonstration, which is one of the reasons I think the Spain the helicopter has helped so much. But a good instructor demonstration. And I think it might have even been Jerry Grayson, but somebody, one of the persons who said to me, Dennis, never be afraid of flying lots yourself. Because while you're flying, he will copy you. And if you're a reasonably good pilot, he can only turn out to be a reasonably good pilot, but he can only copy you. There, that, that's that's just one aspect of it. There are others, but uh, uh, to try and summarise that, good, proper demonstrations. No, fantastic. That's that's brilliant. Okay, let's, let's jump into the display flying then. I'll leave that. Hang on. I'll press that button again. So this is a shot of you in uh, in South Africa. I think it's one of your, your more recent uh, displays. Uh, yeah, as you see, you led into the display as a you know I guess a, not so much a sales tactic, but definitely as a as an add-on for the uh, for the helicopter sales. What sort of can you talk about the world championships and, and things like that? So you know, where's the display flying taking you around the world? Well, yeah. Um... We started the demonstration program uh, at the various UK air shows, and in no time at all, I was being invited to do them. But because uh, if we turned up at an air show, and it's nearly all Enstrom in those days, um, we didn't have to pay the stands. And, and the air show stands are pretty expensive. They said, well, you turn up to your display. We won't uh, we'll give you a free stand. So that's how it got going to start with. Um, I don't I haven't got a lot of open at the moment, but I'm maybe with the first seven or eight hundred displays on that basis. Um, Farnborough, of course, every year came up, and that was a good one because that's a professional show. Big in Hill Ditto. Some of the other shows what I call candy floss shows where the crowd don't really know what's going on. Um, so all they want is lots of noise and lots of manoeuvres. Um, then, <laughs> I suppose, it came to about 86, well, it was 86, um, I soon heard about the World Championships. I had actually taken part in the 1973 Championships, but only as a co-pilot in the non-freestyle flying. I was co-pilot to Mike Meagher, and I think we came last or so, pretty low down the scheme. Um, no, I just wasn't doing properly. Um, but then Mike actually, Mike Meagher, that's the guy I just mentioned a moment ago, he actually won the 1973 Freestyle World Championships in an Einstein. Now, of course, I cottoned onto that like a good one. And it was featured, I featured the helicopter with it, laurel leaf around it in adverts and all sorts. And suddenly people you know, started to take notice. But then to move the link between that and, and the display flying, when I left Spooner Aviation to start my own business, a skyline helicopter to put in park, I suddenly found people saying, well, where are you now? We want you to do a display. I had to explain to them that now, I'm sorry, the freebie days are gone and I needed to charge. Oh, no, I'm about charging you because, you know, a reasonable fee we will pay. So I then caught on to the idea that um, that we'd, um, we could earn money out of it. So now fast forward to 86, I took part in the 86 championships. I came fifth. Um, a lot of people said that display was probably good enough to win, but I unfortunately lost a tail rotor control through the display, and I had to do a high-speed run on landing. But nevertheless, for some reason, probably a consolation prize, they gave me a fifth place. 
Um, I didn't do much more the next display I took, right forward to 1993, where I entered the championships again with an Enstrom at RAF Rawton, which is now outside of Swindon, and I practiced hard for it. Um, and display flying is somewhat different to show flying because you're, you're, you're shooting for points. Uh, and I won it that year. Um, Quite a lot of competition. The Americans were over, the Germans, the Belgians, the South Africans, the French, and uh, so it, you know that's probably my best letter. Um, then I suppose then because once you once you've won something like that, it's brought an awful lot of publicity. Some of which I don't want, but nevertheless it, it, it has brought that. Um, and I know for a fact it's brought me a lot of business. And rightly or wrongly, people ring me and say that if you can explain like that, you must be a great instructor. And two don't go together necessarily. Um, but I do know the type, and I think one of the small byproducts, and I've not been asked it before, and I'm asking myself the question, but one of the small byproducts of being a display pilot is you can allow your pilot to go further into the road making mistakes and getting the aircraft a little bit wrong in attitude terms without worrying about it and still coaxing him to recover from the situation he's got himself into. Pilots learn fastest when they are correcting their own mistakes. If you go and keep correcting the mistake he's making, he won't learn nearly as fast. He just thinks I made a mistake and that pilot's sitting on the other side of the seat. The airplane will sort it out for me. No, I don't do that. I say, look what you've done now. You've got your road drop and uh, all over the shop. You've got the, the hold out of the cockpit. Now, this, what are you going to do? And I wait to see what he does. And sometimes I'm making him say, we need right pedal. We need to open the throttle. And again, on a side note, there, one of the issues there is that you do need for training a helicopter where the instructor can allow that to happen, i.e. it needs good reserves for handy. There are certain helicopters out there, I'm not going to mention them by name, probably the most successful helicopter in the world though, where you can't do that. But nevertheless, uh, people do buy the machines. Um, I don't know if I've answered totally the question. Um, more display flying uh, after 2002. Sorry, after 1902, I went to uh, Austria. Third place, third there. Uh, but I changed types. I went to a Schweitzer 300. Um, 2005 was what I think was my best ever championship flight. You can see it on the internet anytime you like. Dial up Rural France, Dennis Canyon 300 display, and I think that was the best display I've ever done. Um, and I got the highest points, 178. The next closest was the Russians, who were half a dozen points below that. And then somebody said to me, You left the display box. And I was disqualified. I thought that would, I think, mean, excuse me, that was very, very naughty of me to do that. I don't mind, it's one of these things you talk about. Um, after the France, I then did this last, my last display with Germany um, at Eisenach, just on the old Russian border, and uh, I didn't do too well. Uh, last minute, I had to change helicopters I like, practiced on, and I went back for insurance reasons. I went back to a, a, a non turbocharged instrument which didn't have enough power, but nevertheless, I committed, committed myself to going, uh, and I think I came forth. So, yeah. And that's the, the um, gentleman in the in the photo on, on the bottom right there. And uh, I'll, I'll shut, shut up, shall I? No, that's right. I was going to say the, the gentleman in the in the bottom right there. And again, I'm just conscious of time. And for folks listening, like you've got, we've got to fit 60 uh, plus years of, of flying in a in a short session here. But uh, yeah, the gentleman on the bottom right. Um, if you can just quickly introduce him, or we'll talk about him. And uh, he's actually got a video on YouTube where he's opening uh, beer bottles. I think it is with the, the toe of a of an R22. It's Matteo, of course, isn't it? Um, I th you're talking about the guy with the red Robinson. Man. Yes, yes. Okay, that is in fact at Agen in Austria, where I came third. Um, lovely man. Um, we keep in touch on the internet. That was the first and last time I've met him. Uh, you know, I, I keep following what he does. He's a great display pilot, um, and I think he actually—I I got lost touch, but I think he did win one of the one of the events, of course. Um, but uh, it's, it's his Alpha Aviation on the airplane. I think that was, must have been his airplane, otherwise I wouldn't be standing nearby. 
All right, well, let's keep moving in. So one of the other big aspects of your career is, is obviously the, um, I guess, the journalism or the writing uh, and reviewing of helicopters. So, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience as a as a reviewer, I guess, and how did you get into that? Well, age. <laughs> age. <laughs> I know that I could have to stop at some stage. I, I keep getting a class on medical. In fact, just two weeks ago, I passed in a gap yet again. Um as you get older, blood pressure goes up. Mine's a little on the high side these days. They still said it's not bad enough, but give me some advice of what I should do. So in 2006, um, so here we're talking nine years ago, um, I've, I've always wanted to write, and I have written a few articles on, believe it or not, on tropical fish and pox, um, anti pox. But um, I was invited to go to the Duxford uh, helicopter show and review the show, and I did that for a magazine called Loop, which was quite a very popular magazine, very popular newspaper actually, an aviation newspaper. And I wrote the article for them, and people liked it. Um, and so uh, I was offered the job of writing a monthly column for the Loop, which I did. And that one you're looking at there was me with a leather jacket, um, and I was just about to fly, if I hadn't flown it already, the um, Hermes version. The 135, if you're a fashionist, fashionist, you know what Hermes is. It's a, a posh firm that makes handbags at 20 grand a time, and they take a 135 helicopter, Eurocopter 135, uh, and put their touch on it and charge another million euros for it. Um, the one on the right, 49, the Canadian Registry 49, it wasn't in those days when I did that one at Blackbush, that's a, that's a review. Um, I had to fly there with Belgian. Chief test pilot, um, and did an article on that. And I've done so far now 90 articles. I've been in the other day, the invoice is coming out, I've done 90 articles. Um, sadly, the Loop magazine folded for reasons I don't know, probably in 2011, 10, 11. Um, but Blades, the one on the right, an all dedicated helicopter magazine, continued for a long time, and I did probably another 20 articles for, for Blades. But, I believe they are still running, but only as an internet issue. I'm not sure. I haven't seen one come out lately. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I'll have to check it out. But uh, definitely, if you've got copies of the text of those 90 articles, um, we'll have to work out a way we can uh, get those shared around too, depending on well, the copyright. Let me just say that. I, I've looked, you know, with as I've got more and more time on my hands, I've been looking at some way of taking those articles, there's 90, probably over 100 now, um, and choosing what I think are the best, there's, a, there's the one about the double engine failure at, um, at Western Joining at night, and uh, I've got so much feedback on that one uh, that that would be sort of, I wouldn't say top of the list, but certainly one I'd like to write about. Um, then the Canberra history, I flew the Canberra for a long time in the Royal Air Force, and it's not generally known what a horrendous accident record that airplane had simply for one silly little reason. So I wrote after that, and various other articles, so yeah. If you personally get interested or in some other way, I, I'd love to put together the articles, the best of the articles, and read them so that take out all the idiocy so I used to write that sometimes. Um, and, um, and, and get other published them in some way or through you, do whatever is necessary. No, yeah, I'm sure we can sort something out there. Uh, folks, if you're listening, just um, use the chat box and keep sending questions through, and I'll either stop Dennis and fire them at him or we'll cover them at the end. So. Uh, just checking in with everyone if you can still see the screen and still hear us just uh, use a little webinar controls there to put your hand up and it just lets us know that you're you're traveling along with us okay thank you yep cheers guys and yeah look definitely you know keep piling the questions through and we'll get to those shortly just uh, very quickly the center of the screen there Dennis is the the book uh, appointment on uh, Lake Michigan uh, if you just quickly touch on that and then we'll, we'll go to the next slide yeah um I, I think I've mentioned once already, sadly in March 2000, uh, I lost my son, who was age 18 at the time, uh, in a Swiss 300 uh, accident, which was nothing to do with either me flying it, so I actually just played that particular machine. Um, uh, but it was a bad piece of engineering, which I can't go into it at the moment easily. It, it's available, all the information on that's available in the internet. But anyway, uh, I've always said I've, I've written a few articles and had some, some success there. I decided I'd write that article, um, I'd, I'd write that book rather, um, and give it a name because the, the guy starts a helicopter flight from the ice frozen 
the surface of Lake Michigan and get up to some shenanigans, which is in the book. Um, looking back at it, and I've got copies of it now, it wasn't written all that well. I got it published, um, and I think we sold more in America than England. I doubt we sold 400 of it in East England, but I know in America we sold a few thousand. Um, and the, now what I've done, I have more time on my hands, I think really said. Um, I've rewritten the book. It's it's almost the same story, but I've updated it. And it's now uh, an ISIS thing, which if I'm going to get a public publisher, they might turn away from that for a political reason. But I, I'd like to think that what I've written now is an 88,000 word thriller. I call it um, Dangerous Appointment. It is available as we speak on Amazon's Kindle, three or four quid, um, and I believe it's a blooming good yarn. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult as an author because you can't see what the trees. But the feedback I've had so far has all been very, very good, um, and uh, I might think at some stage I will get a publisher, or certainly an agent or something. Um, I, I think about that. Just one minute. I reckon it's a sort of book. If you're on a long journey somewhere, a plane journey, a train journey. Take that with you and uh, you'll enjoy it. All right. Well, and, yeah, I was going to say, keep, you, keep your uh, powder dry there just for the for the book for a moment, but uh, because we'll, we'll cover that in the, in the next slide. But yeah, again, here's a couple of covers of um, Blades, which all feature uh, you on the front. So yeah, that's uh, a sure fair effort. If I'm dodging about a bit, shall I talk about the, uh, the articles there? The one on the left, of course, that's the the great koala. The, and there's a single engine helicopter, a real single, that's why it says they're happy to be single. Um, I did a report on that up somewhere up in, um, yeah, that was up in, um, in East Anglia. Um, that's what I loved about working for Blades. They would ship me out on all sorts of interesting um, tasks, and that one in the centre there was with the um, Boreham, the Boreham Airfield, um, with the um, police air support unit ASU. Uh, and I got to fly over a couple of days with their police. Um, as you can see on the picture, we can't see the part that I was obviously. It's one three five that machine, so I obviously um, qualified to fly a police machine. A couple of captains I flew with their pilot, but lovely, lovely time. There's lots of stories about that particular day. Um, well, I don't want to waste all their time, take up too much time. We actually got to one road traffic accident, um, and the woman was trapped in the car against an electricity pylon and the, um, the rescue services wouldn't touch the car because of the electricity, the electric shock and I just said to the pilot, I won't go down there, I'll, go, I'll do it if I can, so I'll go and do it, but we can't leave that woman in that bloody car. But anyway, they did and uh, I mean, she died on the flight. Mm. Um, on the same trip we also had a 72 year old, I was probably not much you know, older than that myself, um, who fell through a greenhouse roof. And as far as I was concerned, with blood on the floor, the size of a table, uh, a dinner table, uh, he had to be dead. And I've got a lovely picture in my album here as, as, as a carting away from the helicopter. And uh, I look across and I see him wave a hand, so I sort of shout out, you all right? And he puts his hand up and says, yeah, having <laughs> just fallen through the greenhouse room. One on the right is the gazelle, of course. Um, the chap on the left is the owner of the machine. There's a story attached to that, as with all of them. You can see how level that ground is, and the photographer, Dave Spurns, a real, real super, super extreme photographer, um, was with us, and we dropped him off, and he wanted the picture with that, those little ripples in the sand. He wanted that, and it was very nice too. But the girl video um, lady we had uh, was the most unhappy of being in a helicopter. So she's not doing so sick, I really must get out. So I had to lift off, go back to the base where we, where we, left, uh, where we lifted off, and drop her off. But what I didn't realise was you can see how flat that is, the tide was coming in. And the water you can see in the background there probably was only 20, 30 feet away. And in time for that to get under the skids of the helicopter would be minutes. Anyway, when I get back now to, get to my first trouble, I can't find it. So I'm feeling the worst she's gotten in from water. And I couldn't find the same the location because it all changed. So we literally got north of where we were and I flew down the coast very low level until I found him. Got there. He wasn't the slightest bit concerned. He just moved away to slightly higher sand and was still snapping away. 
Well, I think I saw a uh, Facebook uh, post recently. You know, I, I take it from context as the same guy, and he was, uh, yeah, he mentioned he had you know a couple of thousand dollars worth of camera gear with him, and he was trying to work out what he was going to leave behind when he had to, to swim uh, for sure. Story, Nick, the guy. I must have put it on the uh, on the YouTube or the Facebook, and he must have spotted it. Uh, you do get some nice feedback. I'm, I'm not sure. That I've talked to you about the guy that threw himself out of the camera once. If you ask a question or whatever, but I'm not sure how the time is going. So. No, I'll, I'll keep this moving along, just uh, purely on time, and yeah, we'll catch that one later on. So, yeah, folks, if, you, if you're listening along and obviously watching this back as a as a video, if you uh, if you go to denniskenyonlive.com forward slash book, that will actually take you straight to Amazon, uh, where you can you can see Dennis's book there on Amazon. Obviously, you know, purchase it or, or check the details out there. But but yeah, Dennis, so you, you quickly got into the book uh, beforehand, and, and basically it's a, a rewrite and an update. Um, of the previous book in it, uh, can you just, I guess, yeah, quickly talk um, one about the, I guess, the, the characters in the book, uh, without giving too much away, and then the, the, the process of actually, you know, physically sitting in front of a, a keyboard and, and, and writing it using your aviation experience. Yes, it started off. I happened to be at a seminar uh, in Menominee, Michigan, and uh, being an ace, I got there 24 hours too early. Um, I'm in my uh, hotel room looking out of the window and I look at one of these, in those days, digital clocks uh, which alternated with the temperature. They still got them in the States. And it suddenly said minus 10. I thought, oh, that's cold. Um, and I'm watching a bit more and it flashed off because that was in um, centigrade and suddenly it came up in Fahrenheit. <laughs> and minus 10... Fahrenheit is 42 degrees below the freezing point. Anyway, um, I got talking to the barman downstairs later on and uh, saying, you know, this sort of temperature. Um, and he said, well, if you're interested, the lake's frozen over. We could uh, take my my snowmobile and drive out there. And I thought, well, I've got 24 hours to do nothing. Let's do it. And so we skated on out there and stopped and he switched off the engine, which I wished he hadn't done. In fact, you're walking 20 miles across the lake back if you couldn't be stark. Um, and suddenly I realised how cold it was and how quiet it was. And every now and again there was a crack as the ice moved. And I thought, what a wonderful place to get up to a piece of skull thuggery. And so that's where my book starts. Um, went back and I actually started to write there and then on toilet paper and all the bits of paper I could get and slash out the story. It, it concerned a bloke like me, but it wasn't me, um, who is tricked into making a flight from the airfield in the Normandy to landing on the ice and picking up a man. No disclosing at the stage who the man was. Um, he, he didn't even know he was picking up a man. He thought it was drugs or he didn't sorry, start again. He wouldn't do drugs, but he thought it was money to be taken out of the country or some some dodgy deal. But when he then lands on the ice and finds out who he's got on board of a passenger, he realizes he's in terrible trouble. And he spends the rest of the book trying to, to sabotage the plan. Uh, it's a huge, huge ransom. Now he's required now to fly the helicopter and the man across the frozen Great Lakes, land at Ontario to refuel, then down the St. Lawrence River all at night, um, and out over the Atlantic, leaving the coast um, just outside uh, Portland, and finding a shop, a ship, a luxury ship called the Champagne Princess, and he's got to land on that ship where his passenger will be kept prisoner. All right, you better better leave the uh, the, the open loop there for people to come back and uh, and find out how that uh, all closes out. It just finishes quickly with a huge rescue operation, which I suggest it doesn't. I can't tell you yet. <laughs> <laughs> now you've actually flown that route. I think you, you, you say you've actually flown that area. Um, so I did do that route, yes. Um, a few years back, oh, I don't know what it was, certainly before I wrote this recent copy, um, I met a man who, I can't give his name, he's quite well known, um, who bought a 480 inch drum. That's the turbine version of the 280. It was a five seat machine, a bit faster, bigger capacity. And he thought, what a, what a, good thing it would be to fly it back to England and land at the helicopter exhibition at Red Hills, it was in those days. 
And so that's what we did. We went out there, got this thing, got it tanked up. Well, it didn't get tanked up at Menominee. Um, flew across Michigan, the lake, landed at uh, Cadillac, which is near sort of the eastern coast, um, then up to Niagara Falls um, uh, to refuel. And then, but I didn't do that in the book, we went up to Ontario to refuel. Uh, and, uh, and straight out, we got as far as, um, not Portland, um, I forget the name of the place now, where everybody put fuel tanks in their airplanes. And we put another tank in so that we had six hours of endurance. And the idea was then to go from there across to Kulasuk in Greenland, uh, uh, or Sonderstrom, which we decided depending on the weather, across to, um, uh, um, oh, I forget the name, the Hebrides, of course, and then Scotland. Uh, in the event, we had a major uncertainty in the aircraft, and we had to abandon the aircraft, had to come back on the jet. And so we went later on and picked it up. So that's where I got the idea for the, really um, the experience to, to write about what I did. All right, Jensel. By the way, all the proceeds that, sorry, if I can buzz in, all, all the proceeds of the book um, went, the first one went to help the scholarship. We've run, I've run totally run out of money. I don't have the business I had before. If I could get somebody really interested, a media company to and the girl I'm looking at now, you just change shots. The girl is the last scholarship winner, and we've had the last three scholarship winners happen. I've been females, as it happens. Um, but I'd want to run the scholarship again in 2016. I've been offered a hanger. Um, when I had my business, well, my time was free, the helicopter was really free, the cost was simply to fuel the landing fees and all the associated cost of getting the private license. That's Gone now, and I'm just going to have to write a check for fifteen or twenty thousand pounds to an outside agency to do the scholarship. And I'm afraid that's you know, it's not possible to, to earn that sort of money these days, so I can't do it. So I'm looking for a media company or anything, or maybe the sales of a book if to hit the high spots, or any way I can to get enough money to continue the scholarship. Um, the picture on the left is young my son Den when he was three. Uh, in an Enstrom Golf Echo Charlie Hotel, I spoke to Echo because it was sold to a man who lived in Echo Hall in Northern Ireland. Uh, of course, the big picture in the centre of the den when he was 18, flying an Enstrom 480. Uh, um, I just mentioned the um, 300 with the lady who won the last spot. All right, so yeah, folks, if you, again, if you're listening, um, it's sort of one of those six degrees of separation type things. It's, uh, you know, to be able to get Dennis involved and in, in, in that someone's flying would be a, a very rare, uh, specialised thing to do. So just think about who's in your network and who you can tell about that uh, that scholarship. All right, what I might do, Dan, is the next slide here talks about um, your top takeaway, but I might, just looking at the time, I might go to questions first and then come back and, and we'll cover that, um, your, your top takeaway uh, type thing because I'm not sure how long um, some folks can stick around here. So uh, what I might do, Tim's got a couple of questions about the display flying. Uh, so I'm going to, Tim, just to give you a heads up, I'm just going to unmute your microphone and see if we can uh, chat to you. How's that, Tim? If you can talk there, we'll see if you come through. Yes. Hello, Mick. Hello, Dennis. Can you hear me? Hello, Tim. Dennis here. It's been listening loud and clear. Okay, 100%, Dennis. I'm calling in from South Africa. Um, one question that I have, I mean, everybody says, you know, money, no object, turbine uh, helicopters are nicer than piston helicopters. But for the flying that you do as in display flying, um, arguably, arguably you don't need uh, excessive power and speed. I mean, you do extremely well in a, in a Schweizer 300 in your display uh, flying. Um, aren't turbine pa uh, helicopters even superior or more useful for you in your display flying? I mean, given the turbine lag, the risk of compressor stall, the non-availability of a uh, throttle override um, that you have in a turbine helicopter, are you not actually doing better for your display flying in a, in a piston helicopter in terms of controlling of rotor and engine RPM? Well, the answer to that, Tim, is fairly simple. Um, it's m significantly more difficult to handle a piston helicopter in display flying for the obvious reason that the rotor RPM control is not automatic control as it is with a turbine governor in a jet engine uh, and it, uh, it depends very much on when you're making large um, throttle movements and large collective movements as you are in the display um, that you've then got to maintain rotor RPM. I'd have to say that um, 
if I were teaching someone to do to get a display of soldier, which I'm approved by the CAA to do, um, I would prefer to teach them on a piston simply because it requires a higher level of energy management than does a turbine. And the turbine has more than enough power, and so the power availability is not a problem. Where it is a problem on a small piston, in particular a thing like the Schweitzer or the Enstrom P model. Um, as for finding a turbine compressor stall, I've done, I have, without my logbook, I can't tell you, but I've certainly done three or four hundred displays in turbines, all multi brake turbines. Um, I had never experienced compressor stall. In my very early days, I wrote to, Al to um, Addison uh, and asked them what the significance of was of airflows running across the intake as opposed to directly into it because during my display I do achieve that situation and I'd always watch like a hawk the, temp the turbine outlet temperature um, the, the, as I've mentioned the, the power required through the um, torque meter is not is not a problem. There are torque limits, of course, for all of the temperature and the torque limits, but it isn't a problem in the display flying. But um, the, I was always worried about the the lack of air going through to the turbine. In all the displays, in the early displays, I used to watch it, as I said, like a hawk, and I never saw it, the temperature fluctuate uh, uh, one, one bit at all. So um, when I was in, I don't know if you saw my displays at Waterproof, in last September, October, early October, um, I was flying even more powerful MD, the MD 530F model. Well, most of the MDs you'll see flying around are either 300 shaft engines or 400, 420 shaft engines. That particular one I was asked to fly at Waterproof was 650 shaft engine. So I almost at idle most of the time that display. Does that answer most of the question, or is it madams to it? No, thanks a lot. It does. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Tim Tim's got a follow-up question there too, but uh, Tim, just before we take that one, uh, for everyone else listening, again, there's a chat box there. You can put some questions through, and uh, I can just read them out to Dennis if you want, or let me know if you actually want to uh, jump on live, and you can talk direct to Dennis as well there too. So, yeah, Tim, did you want to ask your second question about the um, the wing over type manoeuvre? Yeah, if I can, Dennis, I've... I've under, tried to analyze um, many of your display flying videos, and some of it, um, you, you seem to see what, what you're doing. It doesn't mean it's easy to do, but at least it seems to be clear what you're doing. But there's one typical standard figure that you do where you almost seem to be entering into a loop. It, it kind of starts out as a, a talk turn, but then instead of returning 180 degrees back to target, you kind of complete the 360 degree turn and you, you at least seen from the from the floor, from the bottom, from the ground, you seem to be kind of inverted. What what maneuver is it actually and how do you achieve that? I suppose I got that maneuver going. It's called all sorts of things, wing over, torque turns a normal. Um, just to say that if you were that interested and you looked into the Facebook and one of the sites where I'm present with videos, you will see a genuine full-scale loop carried out at an Enstrom at an air show. And it's low level, starts at 50 feet, ends at 50 feet. So it is possible. But for, generally speaking, um, you might or might not know, I got one wrong a few years ago, 2008. Um, and so I don't intend to do it twice. Uh, so I've, I've I've really toned down the nature of that that manoeuvre, and this is what we do. I take it you you, you hold a license, obviously. Yes, I have uh, 1,000 hours. Oh, yeah, okay, well, that's great. Uh, right, so look, so you're now sitting with me, and you've asked me to show you the manoeuvre, and we'll call it a wing over, if you like. Uh, each type I fly has a gate speed, and if you ever did a display authority course with me, we learn about gate speed for each particular manoeuvre, and it's set in iron, we don't vary, if, it, if it's 90 knots, it's 90 knots, in the case of uh, the MD, I was using 110 knots for the entry at the gate speed. So we run it up to the gate speed, now of course, you all know as well as everybody, that as you increase the airflow through the disc, the disc flaps back, 
And normally, if you want to fly straight and level, you overcome that by pushing the sidekick in the direction that's necessary. We don't do that. We allow that. We allow that extra power because we've now got the induced trust, and we've got the translation width added to it. So we've got more and more uh, 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 thrust coming from the disc, and we allow that to rise, bring the helicopter up, and the nose will come back. And the, when I get to the right angle situation, i.e., the horizon is now at right angles to me. Believe it or not, and this is where most experienced pilots can't quite believe what I'm doing, is a, a progressively lower the lever. Now, when I was doing a full scale loop, the lever is actually fully down at the top of the loop. And I've, on one occasion in practice, or several occasions in practice, I've split the needles upside down. I've the lever down, and the needles are split. So I'm actually doing an alteration upside down. I don't do that at air shows anymore, and I'm not going to because you know you have one action again, do it same thing again. So now, when we got to the vertical position, we now introduce our cyclic and progressively lower the lever, but not fully down. And when you get about as far as you want to go, and bear in mind that we are all required to not exceed the attitude limitations of the flight manual. So the most we can do is 90 degrees to the ground, which is what I try to keep within. So when we get to that attitude, I then start to feed in the pedal in the direction I want to turn, normally um, with the torque, normally. So the nose wants to go to the right, and I squeeze to the right. You can do it to the left against the torque of an of a, of a American airplane, of course, not a European one. Uh, and then you roll the machine round with the lever fairly well down, cycling it round, just literally flying it round and rolling it straight and allowing the nose to drop, of course, rolling it straight onto the heading that you want to exit on. But the other thing is there's also, apart from a gate speed, there's a gate height. And the reason I had an accident in Salt Lake City in 2008 was I never achieved the gate height. So you set in your mind a gate speed for the entry to the maneuver and the gate height, and if you don't get to the gate height, you abandon the maneuver and convert it into something different, whatever. Um, but assuming we've made the gate height, uh, and the must, that will depend very much on the power available, the temperature of the day, and all the usuals, and you, roll, you can roll it out on whatever heading you like. Now, you've asked the question, I've got it to, to a certain uh, 180 degree turn. Now, if you want to continue it on through 360 degrees, which makes it look like a loop, you simply roll it round on the cyclic, combination of cyclic and pedals. And not until you've got the nose fully down, well down towards the ground again, you start to reintroduce the collective. Well, I'm not, I sure, guess that's I'm very, I'm not sure if that's a very good <laughs> <that> training with you. <laughs> it's as good as I can do without all you sitting alongside me and using my hands in a model helicopter. Yeah, it would, would be lovely to do some training with you. <laughs> well, you better be quick, because I'm 82. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I'll be going to Africa again uh, for the next AAD. I, I don't know. Um, I spoke to somebody only two days ago, and they said, yes, we, we think we, you're going to be asked by Safamar to to come down to the next mm. uh, AAD air show. But that's that's another eight excellent. Months. If we ever do, or, or whatever, Tim, you've got my. You can soon get my email on the internet. Just email me, mate, if you want to know anything at all that I can help with. It's all free, and uh, I, I, I really want to see a few people, pilots, especially experienced pilots like yourself, I want to see them come into this industry and take over from me. There are two or three in this country, but it's it's a it's a, it's a big grey area. I've had lots of very experienced pilots come to me and say, Dennis, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You're bringing a cavalier attitude to flying, and we are trying to teach discipline. Nobody says that about fixed wing. Uh, I don't know the answer to it. I do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I get paid well to do it. Um, and that's all I can say about it. And uh, it, it, It's pretty safe, and I'd like to think it's 100% safe now. Um, when I was flying at Waterproof, I knew the airfield height there was 4,500 feet, and the temperature was only 80 degrees, but I was flying the turbines. Power didn't come into it. Excellent. All right, Tim. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, Tim. Yeah, they're a great question. So what I want to do, Tim, I'll just mute you for now.
But uh, if you want to think about if you've got any another last question, and everyone else, again, if you want to send this through, we've got time for about one or two more questions. But I also asked one, Dennis, just leading on from that. Uh, we didn't cover it in the display flying section there, but you know, if pilots are, are watching this or if they're just out, you know, they, they look on YouTube and watch your videos and they watch other display videos, and uh, you know, they, they get a rush of courage at a, at a, a show day or something like that when they're out flying, and uh, and figure they, they're going to have a have a crack at it and uh, and sort of show off type thing. Uh, what sort of advice do you have is about, you know, can you just sort of indicate, you know, how much practice you do leading up to a display um, that it's, it's not an off-the-cuff thing. You just go out and, and decide that, uh, you know, you know, throw it around. Uh, that it's, it, I'm really it, glad you asked that. I'm really glad you asked that, Mick, because I forgot to – I should have said it, and I should have made the raising point. Um, I said to you that there are pilots out there that think it brings a cavalier attitude to flying. Well, I counter that by when people come to me, and I have issued quite a few display authorities, I'm approved to do so in England, but attitude is everything. I'm not interested in your skill. It's not difficult to be a display pilot. What is difficult is getting your head around the fact that you must be self-disciplined beyond belief, completely self-disciplined. So I have lots and lots of chats with the guys before we start. Um, I would never recommend anyone does what I've and will did myself, and that was in the 70s. I just went out and practiced by myself and increased the angles of the maneuvers until I got there. You know, if I had an accident, I wouldn't know what would have been said. I didn't as it happened. Um, but these days, what I would say is you first of all must get some fixed wing aerobatic experience if you've got some. Uh, that's not 100% certain, but yes, it would be highly advisable. But then go to somebody who's got a DA, and I don't think you even have this system in, in Minnesota. I don't think you do. Um, you can come to England any time you like, go to America. There are guys out there. Um, there's two or three DAEs in this country. Um, I like to do a minimum of five hours with a guy on the, on the basic manoeuvres, satisfy myself he's not going to go away and do something silly and have an accident. Uh, and when he's got the right level of discipline, say, fine, well, you, know, you do what I do, uh, but you've got a head start on me because I had to teach myself the first bit. I've just finished a DA with a guy, and we did 20 hours. At his request, he wanted to go on and on and on and on. Um, it's it's a wonderful thing to do. It's, it's I mean, the world is dog can fly fixed wing, uh, doing aerobatics, if you want to call them that. We call it, I like to call it freestyle flying. Um, but not in helicopters, and uh, I've no idea if you've got any display pilots in uh, South Africa. I, can't, I imagine you haven't, otherwise why would they ask me to come down and display a machine? Um, so that's the message. Uh, do it, please do it, get interested, carefully and carefully as you go. Get some advice, advice, advice from somebody like yourself, and tread very, very carefully, and teach yourself the news if, if, if that's where you've got to go. Good morning from Vancouver Island in Canada. Um, it's got a question for you, Dennis. Uh, as far as uh, aircraft that you've flown uh, not in a d display role, um, what did you find? Um, uh, any aircraft in particular you found uh, very nice to fly? Um, yeah, I'm pretty experienced with a across the board of machines. Been doing it so damn long. Um, I'm up to 34 types now, so got some sort of idea of what I like. I suppose I've been asked a question. I've written articles about it. Um, one article was the top ten helicopters in number six, uh, and in both cases, as a personal machine that responds to psychic movements the way I want, where the controls are most harmonised, it's got the best uh, aerodynamics, it's got the best power to weight ratio, got to be the McDonnell Douglas 500. Uh, that's my all-time favourite. Um, I found quite a few twins. I suppose in the twin market, I would say uh, Augustus 109. Um, two engines. Once you start to get into the heavier weight machines, you're really moving away from what I like doing, i.e. close up to the crowd, display flying. I know in England we've got a guy that, that displays in Chinook, Carl Zarecki. He flies it beautifully. That thing weighs, what is it, 22 tons, is it? 22,000 pounds, whatever it is, 10 times 12. Um, so 
they can be done, but I haven't got the level of experience to move into that market. So to ask you a question, I would say uh, number one machine I like to fly is the MD500 um, for and to display, and number two to display would be the N Strong, the turbocharged version, and for all just general flying around, guess what? The lovely old Bell Jet Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate it. You mentioned the uh, the koala going through there, like the, the single version of the uh, the 109. Is, is, it, is there much difference between the, the 109 and the, and the koala? Well, I found both, and the koala's got more power. <laughs> really? Okay. There you go. It's, it's eight seater, you know. <laughs> the one I was like anyway. We didn't have much fuel on board, but boy, does it lift. It's done for it, so American folks so. uh, Is that Topher, Is that the name right? Is that uh, is it how you pronounce your first name? Yeah, one. that's it, mate. Just, uh, just a short version of Christopher. Oh, gotcha. What are you flying in uh, in Canada at the moment? Uh, I'm actually an engineer over here. I'm okay. a commercial pilot as well, but uh, yeah, engineer on uh, 212, 407, and long ranges at the moment. You're on Vancouver Island. I certainly am, Sydney. Well, I'm trying to trade my better half to let me go to Canada. <laughs> The nearest to Canada I've got is to Gimli and uh, on the Canadian side of the of the Niagara Falls, but uh, want to go. I'd love, love to go to Vancouver Island. You've never you've never been to Canada, is that correct? Well, only to Gimli, just uh, when I was in the Air Force, and uh, um, no, no, I've not crossed over. I, I, I'd love to go. I really would. I, well, I'm going to go somehow. I don't know when, but uh, it's, it snows too much there, though. <laughs> Oh, the weather. The weather's not brilliant, but uh, helicopter-wise, it's um, yeah, it's it's from what I've seen, the, only the states uh, rivals it. There's uh, all kinds of machinery. Where I am at the moment, there's a camo out the front and S92 in a hangar and uh, EC135 that they're they're working on a bubble. I'm drooling already. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very interesting, very interesting for for a kid from North Queensland, uh, remote North Queensland. It's uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a big eye opener. I've got a guy here. You must know him, Phil Croucher, who's a great Canadian man. Um, he's he's bit up now on um, on the, the training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen uh, I've seen him around extensively. He's uh, he's a he's an authority. <laughs> All right, Dennis, I think we're about up on time there. So I wanted to uh, move that side there with your contact details. So, again, if anyone wants to, to see more videos or find out more about what Dennis does or get in contact, the, uh, the web address and the, the email address are, are there on the screen. And, uh, look, I'll read those out just in case I turn this into an audio podcast later on. But, uh, yes, yeah, it's obviously dennis-kenyon.com. You can find Dennis's details there. So, look, um, yeah, Dennis, thank you so much for your time today. And, and folks, for... Uh, coming and joining us and hanging out and uh, and spending some time with Dennis. Appreciate you guys for coming along today as well. Um, so yeah, Dennis, any sort of closing closing words? Well, yes, Mick. Thanks ever so much. It's the first time I've ever done anything like this, and I enjoy. It. I, I, I think I said to you when we were chatting yesterday. I really, at my age, I really want to try and put something back into the industry. Apart from the obvious terrible reason, two thousand. It's been a wonderful industry for me. Industry for me. I've enjoyed it. I'm still enjoying it. And I still want to go on display flying if, I, if I'm able to. Um, so if I can have do things like this and, and meet guys like Tim and talk to them, uh, it's my way of trying to put something back into the industry that I enjoy too much. Tops, and, and look, just we'll sneak one more question in. just had it come through there. So I think it's from uh, Tofu. If I got your, your name wrong, I, I apologise. But the question is, hey, Dennis, um, what makes a, a good display aircraft? And then we'll, we'll finish on that. Easy one to answer, as far as I am concerned. But there are other display parts you might think differently. First of all, I only display multi-blade helicopters, so that restricts an awful lot. It chucks out jet rangers, limits it to things like Enstrom flights. So Will Robinson's out. But having said that, a dear, dear mate of mine displays beautifully a Robinson 44. Uh, and if you said to me, there's 50. 5,000 pounds to go and display a Robinson 44. I couldn't take your money because I'm not experienced enough on that type. So my view is the type you need is multi-blade, certainly a piston to start, uh, and that really, if for photographic purposes, the Enstrom is beautiful. It's a photogenic aeroplane. It looks pretty at any angle, um, and it can be flown 
if you use the energy management system, it looks smooth and sleek. And as I said earlier on, if you do look at that shot of me flying the shark, there's some shark doing a full loop. It looks so graceful and smooth and easy, just as though you're flying it around uh, the countryside. Um, so the Enstrom, yes. Uh, the Slice of 300, which I fly, of course. Uh, that's uh, a great display ship. It's got a little bit more, probably, um, maneuverability because of the smaller disc. It's only a 27 foot disc as opposed to the Enstrom, which is quite a bit bigger than that. Um, so the, the Slice of 300, or Sigourney 300, as it's called these days, um, is a good ship. Um, I have displayed the Westland um, Scout. Again, a multi-blade, but that is a turbine. Heavy ship, probably too big a disc loading for me to want to do it all the time. But having said that, um, the military had their own sharks team, but they were flying the Gazelle similar ship. I haven't dis yes, I have displayed a Gazelle just once, thinking about it once or twice. That's a great, great ship, but in turbines. The MD, of course, the MD 500 series, any of the MDs, the, the A model, the B model, the C, the D, or any of the military versions. Um, that's the oh, and of course I've forgotten. Mustn't forget the Enstrom 480. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a piston helicopter with a beautiful turbine, Rolls Royce turbine engine. So that's a great display machine, which I did in fact display at Waterford with all the other colours in it. Um, so yes, to, to recap, um, if you've got choices, Enstrom 28 to 80, Sikorsky 300, 269, 300. Uh, in the turbine market, you're going to the um, MDs uh, and Enstroms. But there's one I haven't mentioned yet, and I am meeting a guy very shortly um, for a full scale um, look at a possible display of Bruno Bumble's G2 Capri. It's a three blade, it's got a like, combing engine, it's got adequate power, um, and I think that might be a good display machine. And why I think somebody should be looking at that now is, as I'm sure you know, it's new to the world market. It, it is beginning to catch on, and it only needs somebody, you know, there must be people somewhere that will do it, get that machine, display it properly, and I think it will do an install all over and then a Robinson all over. Over to you. Fantastic. All right, Dan, so I'll get you to stay on the line, and, and folks, if you're, you're live on the call, get you to stay on the line uh, for the moment. But what I'll do is we'll we'll call that uh, quits there for the, the recorded version, and uh, we'll uh, see you all online some other stage.